Hello everyone and welcome to the Open Restitution Africa webinar series. We're very glad to have you all join us. Um, my name is Mulemo Mwira. Um, I am from Andani.Africa, which is one of the partners in the um, Open Restitution Africa uh, program together with um, my colleague Chow, who uh, is, is the director of African Digital Heritage based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, by way of sort of short introduction, Open Restitution Africa is a um, very new project. We're still very much in the beginnings of the process, but is, as the video showed you, intended to be a kind of um, introductory space for people who are interested in restitution to get a good understanding of what it is. Um, but also a kind of aggregator where people already working in the restitution space can share information, um, connect, um, and really uh, create a kind of transparent and open process around restitution on the African continent. Uh, very importantly, the project is directly aimed at being Africa-led, Africa-centered. Um, much of the restitution conversation happens in Europe, is driven by European decisions, European politics, um, and we really feel it's super important to be able to create a kind of Africa-centered and inter-African conversation about what we think restitution is and what it should be. Um, and that's very much what this webinar is about. It's about starting that conversation, bringing together amazing minds, people doing incredible work, who can really introduce us to some of the really major questions, debates, um, but also like sort of the great work that um, people are charging ahead with um, under often difficult and complex circumstances. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Chow, who will uh, introduce uh, this afternoon, this evening's webinar. Thank you, Malemo, and uh, welcome to everyone joining us from uh, all over the world. It's wonderful to have you here today. As my colleague Malemo has shared, um, the aim of this webinar series and Open Restitution in particular is just to, to be able to bring to the forefront the voices of African practitioners to understand the complexities of what's happening around restitution, the experiences, the challenges, and the various issues that come up um, within the debates. Now, the people we'll be speaking to today are, are um, incredible, the incredible founders of the Women's History Museum of Zambia. Uh, we'll be speaking to artists Mulenga Kapwepwe and journalist Samba Yonga, who have known each other for years. And in one of their regular discussions about women's history and indigenous knowledge in Zambia, an idea between them transpired. What about we create a uh, women's history museum and, and elevate women's histories and their sources? And so they did, they went ahead with this idea and um, there we have the Women's History Museum of Zambia because of them. Uh, now their mission, particularly of the museum, is to research, preserve, and restore African indigenous knowledge, to collect, archive, and exhibit women's stories, crafts, artifacts, and geopolitical traditions, use sensory engagement to increase under an understanding of how indigenous knowledge is transferred, to incubate indigenous skills and products, and finally, to create a validation system for indigenous knowledge. Now, this is the textbook uh, definition and mission of the Women's History Museum of Zambia. But what I'd like to say about them and what they've done is that it's incredible to see a space in which um, women and Africans were taking control of our history. We are saying that it doesn't matter if you have the money or not, if you have digital spaces, if you have platforms and you can share your story. And I think when uh, Mulenga and uh, Samba talk about their story, we'll be able to see the true testament of um, how digital media in particular is shaping African history, how it's changing narratives, how it's um, creating spaces for new perspectives and a new understanding of who we are. Uh, so I won't take too much of your time. Uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, to welcome to the floor, Samba and Mulenga, who can tell us more about the Women's History Museum, why they started it and um, give you a much more personal introduction to what they do. Welcome Samba and Mulenga. Hi, Chow. Hi, Chow. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Thanks for that fabulous introduction. I feel like we don't almost don't have to say anything. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for joining. I'm Samba, and I'm with Mulenga. And obviously, the story is very interesting of how we started the Women's History Museum. I think it evolved over years. One of the stories is I'd always go to these talks that Bamalenga would have. 
and where she would uh, talk about historical narratives and most of them focused on women and how women contributed to the knowledge system of Zambia. And every time I left that talk, I'd be like, man, Bamalenga needs to put this on a podcast. <laughs> this is me, my journalistic self. Bamalenga needs to do this on TV. Like more people need to learn about this. And obviously the question of why don't we have this in schools? Why don't we see this on TV? Why isn't this mainstream? And so from her talks now, I would follow her to her office and would sit for hours talking and talking. And you know, this has changed my life and that narrative applies here. Until one day she said, you know what, let's just set up a museum. And I was like, brilliant, let's do that. And so I think for the next six months, we set about doing all the paperwork of like, okay, if we set up a museum, what would it do? And then I think we came to the conclusion that what we want to do is set up a virtual museum because if we waited for the building, it would take years for us to fundraise. And for us, it was really urgent to get the information out there because it was clear that it was needed. So what we decided to do was set up a virtual museum as a way of restoring narratives of obscured knowledge systems, particularly focused on women and find a way to mainstream them so they can be easily accessible for anyone who's interested and even you know, move them from intellectual property uh, into mainstream digital media, into schools and even to the market. So obviously a daunting and big ambition, but we felt that it was possible if we combine both our skills. And, and the first thing we did was set up all our social media because that was the quickest uh, way to do it. And we thought, what, what could we do to get people to know what we're doing? So we put a call out and said, listen guys, we are collecting narratives of women who have been obscured from history. Is there anyone out there who has stories uh, about women in history or even contemporary history who've done something amazing? And we were surprised at the response we got. So many people wrote to us telling us that they would like to donate content, objects, narratives. They would like to connect us to people who've been documenting stories of women, uh, both before colonialism, during colonialism, post-colonialism. And we're just overwhelmed and kind of elated at the fact that there's more than us who is out there looking for this information. So we now started collecting these items, these objects and started documenting them. And we realized that we needed to set up an archive system, a digital archive system. We also needed to find a way to mainstream these stories. It was great that now we had them. We we're like, okay, then what do we do with them now? Because we're not gonna wait until we open the museum three years later to share these narratives. So we decided to uh, conduct an experiment a digital experiment. We were like, what if we produce content and share it on our platforms? How would people react? Because as much as we found this information interesting and applicable and relevant, you know, even today, we wondered whether other populations did, whether, you know, other demographics did. So we decided to select a number of stories from Bamalenga's anthology, stories that she had been collecting over years from the archives and other places, and then make them into contemporary animation podcasts called Leading Ladies. And the interesting thing about that was we decided to, okay, if the idea of women as leaders, even before colonialism was a reality, how would we hook and interest people to watch these stories? So we decided to use archetypes of masculinity to title the stories. So for example, we had the general, we had the innovator, we had the head of state. These are all titles that you think of only associated to men, but these were actually women in uh, colonial, before colonial times who led. And we thought this would be a great way to introduce the stories. So we developed the series in conjunction with Hebo's and uh, press the button to send on social media. And we were really like surprised because at first we thought, oh, okay, the women will respond maybe, you know, they'll like it. But we were just so overwhelmed 
with the kind of responses that we got, you know, everybody wanted to know, firstly, how come we don't know these stories? Where are these stories? And why don't we learn these in schools? And so for us, it kind of like justified the assumptions that we had been making on our own, that this could influence how we learn, this could influence our understanding of knowledge systems, not only in Zambia, but in, in places that have similar uh, kind of like population, populations and social constructs such as ours. So this was really exciting and it justified for us, you know, setting up the museum, documenting this uh, history, also tracing this history and verifying it because that is a point that was quite interesting and that mm. also led to our second project yeah wow i mean yeah. I, I, no sorry go ahead Marina. okay yeah i'm just okay it's going to kind of lead us to the next oh yeah. okay Okay, I think um, what's extremely uh, fascinating also and impressive about what you're doing is the fact that you're creating a new form of how we archive indigenous knowledge. Um, and when you look at the challenges of um, the museum sector in Africa, particularly public museums, is that we have institutions that were either set up as imperial, you know, little clubs to observe the local people, and then they became the National Museum of Kenya, the National Museum of Uganda, and here you are with this um, completely new uh, template of saying, let's start with the audience in mind. Let's start with the people and then move to the objects. And I think that's extremely, extremely um, important in how we define the agenda of, you know, the post-colonial, I would say, African museum. And um, if you could tell us a bit about um, the role of restitution, particularly in the narrative that we, talk, we tell about ourselves, and how this has played out in the impact you have had with the Leading Ladies podcast and just generally around digital narrative and how, how you see this playing out in your world. Okay. Um, yeah, so after the, after the meeting, we've, we've done something else again, which for us started from the, from the people again, from the community, which was a, a partnership with Wikipedia um, where we actually asked the public to, to give us names of, of women that they wanted to, to learn about and hear about. And so we trained um, 34 young Zambians to become Wikipedians so that they contribute to Wikipedia. But it's the public that submitted the names of the people, of the women that we, we, we had to research. So again, it was very much about, about getting that from the public to, to then put it on, the, uh, on Wikipedia. So, what you find on Wikipedia from our Wikipedians is very much part of what people wanted to hear and wanted to learn about their, the women in that country. Um, and then that led us to um, the, our digital, you know, um, our digital platform. Um, we, we had been doing some work with another museum in Sweden and um, kind of stumbled upon <laughs> objects. <laughs> Um, objects from Zambia, about 600 objects from Zambia, which were being stored in the, in the Swedish Ethnographic Museum. Mm -hmm. And we were like, what? <laughs> yeah. A lot of objects. And a lot of them, of course, made by women, uh, you know, that, that, that had stored women's history, uh, narrative stories, you know, uh, women and how they made crafts, women and how they related to the environment. And um, obviously this for us was one, you know, what are these things doing here? <laughs> but um, then the question was, that, so what do we do about this? You know, what can we do about this? Because mm. 600 objects that belong here are there. Mm. Um, and some of them for us were like, oh, wow, you know, we didn't even, we haven't ever seen this object, you yeah. know, or we haven't ever heard this. Mm. But at this point, we were like, oh, this is the, this is the basket that was made by, can we have what? <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was just mind blowing. So we thought, okay, um, we went through it like like steps. Uh, so repatriation or restitution or reparation. Like which one are we going? What are we going to do? And we kind of unpacked those words and said, look, there's there's a, there's an element of of bringing these things back home to Zambia. There's an element of compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an element of 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 of, of, of writing a wrong 
-hmm. And so how do we address those things that we unpacked from those, those three words? And so we, we went to option one, which is let's bring back the things physically. Mm -hmm. So for that, we thought, okay, so we better, if, if we're thinking of physical repatriation, then we better see the physical infrastructure here um, and, and what condition that is in to receive those objects. Mm -hmm. But what we did also is what we did an evaluation of the infrastructure in Sweden that kept the objects, you know, mm -hmm. because there's wood, there's, uh, there's, there's leather, there's mm -hmm. uh, straw, mm -hmm. basketry, there's, there's um, paper, there's, you know, photographs. So we, we looked at the whole infrastructure, what is needed to keep all these things and how it's kept in Sweden, what temperatures, what light, what, you know, what space. Yeah. And then we came back to Zambia and with the uh, Swedish partners, the Swedish Ethnographic Museum, we went to two, two museums here in Zambia and assessed the space. If mm -hmm. the obvious were to come back, do we have the space? Do we have the expertise? Do we have the, you know, all the, the, the temperature controls and everything like that in the, in the, in the storage? Um, we assessed that, we assessed the mm -hmm. stuff. Did, they, did we have the expertise to preserve wood, basketry, mm -hmm. leather, you know, all that stuff? Um, so, for, and then how do we transport the thing or special transportation, mm -hmm. this kind of, so, it, that was really complicated. <laughs> the, stuff, the stuff and skills and that was available, mm -hmm. but the infrastructure was not. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, okay, that's not, so we go to option two. Option two, we thought, okay, so option two, we thought was um, recompense, compensate, mm -hmm. amends. How, how is that going to happen? And when we looked at one, we looked at our own laws as mm -hmm. Zambia, like, what laws are in place for, for repatriation, for, you know, for repatriation. There's not one single kind of law yet that would actually help us to get these things back. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, we looked at the global, uh, the global situation and literally Sweden, Germany, who everybody's got different laws about repatriation. So that was kind of out as well. It would have taken so long. Mm -hmm. We thought, okay, so then, we hire uh, experts to come and help us draw that and it didn't work. So we thought, okay, so what's the third thing? So the third thing was, let's repatriate them digitally then, because that will skip the space and everything else, and we can get them here to Zambia, the quickest way. So we then uh, created a project together with the, with the Swedish Ethnographic Museum uh, and made an application to the Swedish Institute to give us money to create a digital platform where we can actually put all the objects that mm. belong to Zambia on the platform. Um, very three-dimensional, you can actually look at the objects, turn them around, do all that kind of stuff, read, you know, look at the photographs. Um, so we're designing that platform, but we, we, if we're designing that platform, we decided we have to go back to the communities, the owners of the objects, mm. to help us design that, that platform. So. Mm. What we want is a platform that can be used from village to university. Mm -hmm. So from the owners, if they're in the village or if they're in the university, wherever they are, they should be able to access that platform. So in a couple of weeks, we're having our first workshop with three villages where we'll test, we'll, we'll start uh, creating the methodology of, of, of participation mm -hmm. for the owners of objects. Um, how would they engage with the, with the platform? Or how do we design the platform for them? Mm. Um, so we're doing all that stuff. What kind of um, digital tools do they use in the village that would make it easy for them to actually um, be able to participate? Because mm. we want to be able to, 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 to even give information onto the platform, to contribute mm -hmm. to the metadata of the objects. Um, we want them to, 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 you know, when we found the objects in the museum in Sweden, some of them, had lost information, there was no information yeah. about them. But when we brought like a picture, the owners knew them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they said, that's a, you know, that's a button. that symbol means this. Mm -hmm. And we saw that information back, but we want it from the owners of the objects. And so that's why we're designing a way of getting the owners to actually be interactive with the platform mm -hmm. so that they can be contributing the information of objects, how they make them, where they make them, what materials they use, where they go, you know all that kind of stuff, so that yeah. there's real information on each object um, by the owners of the objects. And the owners also place objects on the platform that they feel yeah. would 
yes, context to everything. So we will have that. We're having another one with researchers at university, um, uh, with the, the university department for ICH. Mm. Um, we're having, because there's, there's, there was a bit about intellectual property and how do we make sure that the owners of objects and, and Zambians in general can actually use the IP of these objects and make money out of them and that kind of thing. So we also, right now we have a project going with um, Jewel for Africa. Mm. Jewel of Africa. And we're, we are basically designing jewelry from mythology, from our mythology. Yeah. Into, into jewelry and, and to see how that, that, that works because we want to yeah. see how we can do it for, for our platform as well. You know, how do you get onto our platform? Can you get some yeah. of that stuff? So it's been, it's been kind of a, a long journey. Yeah, yeah. I'd but, say you guys have done so much and even looking at, um, as, as you summarize this, you know, the three maybe major parts of restitution where you have return, you have compensation, and as you speak of access, um, I think what's interesting about what you're doing is also circumnavigating the challenges that are often, you know, um, used against restitution. You know, Africans don't have this, we don't have infrastructure, we don't have skills, we don't have, which in essence um, are, ex could be said to be excuses, but to a certain extent, we need to have this infrastructure and we need to have these skills, but that doesn't mean that nothing, nothing will happen until then. And yep. it's interesting um, for, for, for me as a digital practitioner, but also as a cultural practitioner to see how much you have involved, um, you know, the community and university students within the digital restitution process. I think we often think of digital and physical being worlds apart. And um, I, I, I don't know, what, what do you think particularly around um, how digital restitution influences or has, has, could have a role to play in as a catalyst for physical restitution? Is it something that you're actively thinking of for the museum or for Zambia in general? Yeah, I, th I, think, I, think, for us, I think for us, there's no separation <laughs> yeah. in a way um, between the digital and the, we think it's a, it's a continuum. Um, we, we think of it as a continuum that the physical and the digital are really just a continuum of the other. Um, and there are some things, for example, when we, when we did our assessment, it will be much quicker and much easier for us to bring the, the paper, the documents, the photographs and stuff like that, because for that, the facilities are already here and the expertise is already here. So we would be able to bring the paper and the, and, and the photographs and stuff like that here. That would be like the easiest thing. Mm -hmm. But for us, we, 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 we're thinking of the, digital platform as a springboard yeah. mm. and then to start teasing out the next thing what is then possible what is then possible what is now possible until we can get that stuff because what you want is really that when the objects come they are stored in the optimal you know way you know with with the standards that every museum would want their objects to be stored so but the digital the digital museum for us is two things mm. one it can be, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's at a level where museum to museum, yeah. you can actually sort some things out mm. very quickly. Because if you, if you wait for the global, whatever it is, it's going to take much longer. But with the museum to museum, you can say, listen, we've got 600 objects. We want access to those 600 objects. How do we do it? And you can start sorting it out at that level mm -hmm. without all those complicated laws that everybody's trying to wait through right now. <laughs> so that's, Again, you see, as perhaps it's a contribution to a model mm. for, 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 for everyone else to kind of start looking at and saying, well, maybe we can start at this level. There's an institutional mm -hmm. level that I think Africa can start doing things quickly, mm -hmm. museum to museum, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and get those objects. And we must start thinking of digital and physical as just a continuum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not two separate things, it's, it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a means to the final end. Yeah. but how do we get it yeah. let's find ways of getting it and fortunately, technology is blending us ways and i think another thing that uh, digital does in a way can also act as a as a lobbying tool an advocating tool because a lot of the time these discussions about uh, you know the discourse around repatriation it's a very let's be honest it's quite elitist 
Mm. It's only at a certain level that the conversations happen at institutional level or people interested in the subject. But what digital can do is democratize the information, make it popular, mainstream it. So more people are concerned, more people have vested interest. So if you tell the story, like leading ladies is an, is an example, if that conversation just happened between institution to institution, like, can you please, you know, document these stories about these ladies, mm. you know, the, the institutions might not be moved, but the more we get the, the information out there, the stories out there, the more we're building a collective that's coming together and saying, you know, the populations, whether it's here in Africa, whether it's in Zambia, whether it's all over the world, they're saying, we need these stories. Where are these stories? Can we correct these stories? Can we correct the information that has been uh, wrong and documented in the wrong way? Can we bring back these objects? So it works uh, on a dual um, platform. It advocates using, uh, creating, um, mobilizing a collective that will apply pressure because they want to see that content, they want that information, they want to access it. And also at the institutional level, we're working to influence as well what can be done in terms of restitution or repatriation or digital repatriation. In the last, uh, in the first uh, first episode of our restitution dialogue series with uh, Dr. Njoki Ngumi, we spoke about the, the need for critical mass understanding and just a critical mass um, understanding of the migration of objects, the looting of objects, but also what's there. And I think when you digitize, you're providing a very direct access line um, because there's a big difference between me knowing Kenyan objects are abroad and me knowing which Kenyan objects are abroad. And I think that speaks to the testament that um, you can use this digital objects and the digitized artifacts to inspire the creation of narratives, to, uh, to allow people to use them and reuse them in, very, uh, in various ways. Um, in the Fast Savoy report, very famous and um, uh, influential report, um, there was a recommendation that um, African objects which are to be restituted and held let's, in, in France in this case should be made open access and digitized. And uh, a, response to this, um, a response to this statement was that while this is a good idea, the prerogative and um, the decision to digitize and under which licenses really is um, the decision of the source communities. Yeah. So while this, while digitization is good, um, the people who own these objects and who um, make objects have a right to decide whether they want them digitized or not. And um, I guess a quick question for you is: When you're building the digital platform, um, are you selecting certain objects to be digitized, or are you digitizing the entire 600 objects? How are you going about? your decision to digitize and how this will happen in a very just quick and practical way. Mm, okay, so the, 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 the objects in the Swedish Museum are kind of kind of grouped in collections. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so there's, um, so that there are collections that are very much to do with an area of Zambia and a certain ethnic group, you know, there are collections um, which, which were kind of like collected, but they're kind of clustered in the time when they were collected and not so much from the mm -hmm. group. Um, what, we are, what we are doing, uh, what, we, what we decided to do, I think in the interest of what you're talking about, the, the owners of the objects participating in how they want their objects treated, how the information for those objects will be collected, is that we, we picked two ethnic groups that had quite a bit of uh, objects, um, one in the north, one in the south. And so we're going to work with those communities and we're depending and we're leaving it to them to see how, it's, how they want to, 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 to put these objects. Do they want to put them on the thing? Which ones can we put on them? You know, they, they have to decide which ones. They're in the collection. And these are the things that we want to tease out, you know, because there, there, there could be a place where they say these objects, yes, but these objects, if there's a, if there's a sandbox, <laughs> a, mm. a place that people don't, not the public can see, but we know that they're there, please create that box, you know. So those are the conversations that we are, we want, we are looking forward to actually with the owners of objects to find out how they want to 
want us to treat. What we're saying is, we can do this, we can put them on a platform, we can whatever, but you tell us, you tell us how you, how you want to treat this and how you want to put the information there. What kind of information, who will put the information, who in the village here knows about this or whatever, how, yeah, yeah so, it's it's for for us it's very much a conversation with the owners of of, of mm. the object. Yeah, they will literally design. We've got the technical IT people and whatever, but every the, the, the information will come from the users mm. and the owners of objects, and that's why we're really concerned also about what kind of tool you know digital tools are in the village. What how can they use them? How do we make sure that you know that the interaction continues? How do we do all that? But for us, it's a very, it's a learning experience. Mm. <laughs> I hope it develops for everyone. <laughs> for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. We have to find a way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, it's, it's interesting Just, because a lot of the time, you remember how they would have these objects. And if, even if you look at their list and how they listed the object like spear, bracelet, necklace, with no context, no nothing, because they don't have the information. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, a lot of the objects have been stored in storage for years and years and years without putting it on display because they just don't have the metadata to support it. So this would be beneficial for them as well because then we crowdsource mm -hmm. and find out the meaning of each of the objects, you know. I think one time they had a spear and they were like, we don't know. And somebody said, oh, that's the spear that was the, the kings or the queens, you know, immediately it enriches the object and changes the meaning. And that's the opportunity that this presents as well for both sides. I think yeah. uh, what's, what's beautiful about it in a sense is, despite the fact that the objects are not here, the knowledge is, and uh, yes. we have to give ourselves, um, you know, the appreciation and the love that we need to give this information to us, you know, to share it within our spaces. And you think about the idea of crowdsourced memory, um, which is the crowdsourced memory and the, the narratives that are being shared. But what I particularly find interesting is the idea of a crowdsourced platform. Uh, I think mm -hmm. as, as techies, or, you know, you're often tempted to build something and then give it to the people. But what you're doing is yeah. involving yeah. communities from scratch, even within the pl platform building process, which I think is a very, very important thing. Um, whenever you speak about technology in Africa, someone will always say, but not everyone has access to internet. And I think what you're doing is redefining what technology is, you know, is USSD technology, is radio technology, is, you know, we're expanding the boundaries of what technology means to us. And that's a really, really key point, I think, within the restitution debate, but also looking at the space of digital around the issue of repatriation. Um, I would love to make this a very technology focused webinar. I'm very tempted to, um, but I also have a very <laughs> general, <laughs> I have a very general question about restitution. And um, this is something that we're asking all the speakers. What is there something about working within this restitution process, whether it's personal or professional, um, that you didn't realize prior to go, getting into this this field, uh, but you wish more people sort of knew about this issue? a personal experience or a challenge that you've come across or just something that you feel that you'd like to share about this issue that is not a very well known or understood part of even restitution. Get there, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> one. But I think one, <laughs> one for me is when we're doing the Wikipedia project. And we were so excited collecting all these stories and narratives. We've got like 150 names. And we, the writer started writing the names and we started submitting them. As I'm, like I said earlier, for Wikipedia, it goes into a sandbox, meaning the article goes somewhere and these editors somewhere up there have to go through and verify. Now for a lot of the African articles, if they're not sourced, meaning if it doesn't have an ISBN number or they can't track it on the internet somewhere or some you know, professor somewhere didn't quote it in some paper, then it's not validated. Like they remove the story, they cancel it, they spike it, what we say in journalism. And we came across that so much that it was such a shock to us like, oh, so you mean whatever we say or whatever we discover, our narratives don't matter 
unless it's in a model that is recognizable by a Western education system or some model that has been created by these people. So that was one of the motivations as well for creating the platform as a way of verifying and validating our knowledge systems so that we do not come across this block or this cancellation without even any investigation. Just because you don't fit this profile, you can't be added to this narrative. So that was quite challenging for yeah. us. I think, <laughs> I think for us, that's that. That was literally a body blow because, <laughs> because you know, it was almost like you, you cannot exist until you are validated by some mm. Western scholar or something like, you know what I mean? And it was like, no, but these are, <laughs> these are our narratives, you know, and, and they have been narrated through generations and families and whatever. And I can point to the people who are descendants of that particular line or whatever oh but it's not in the history books like yeah you know so for us i think even with the digital platform it's a way of of starting to to develop enough knowledge uh, enough knowledge so that africans and uh, scholars and everyone can reference the information as a valid source because we've checked it with the owners we've checked it with the historian whoever and the the, the, the information is, is something that you can reference in your scholarly works or whatever it is. But we felt that we must start developing systems as Africans yeah. now, reference systems for our information and knowledge. Otherwise, we'll always depend on Western scholar, you know, and Western ways of validating information to, to, to be valid. I mean, for, for us, it doesn't make much sense, you know, you know, the, the, I, I've read history books written by Western scholars who have completely missed the point simply because they didn't know the, the meaning of a village, yeah. the name, yeah? And they don't understand that the meaning actually tells them when that village was built and yeah. why it was built. And there's so much information in the name of that village, but they don't even know it. And they're, and they're talking about whatever, he's the best scholar on, the, on, the, on this ethnic group. I'm like, no. He doesn't even know what the, you know, like, what village is <laughs> And so for me, it doesn't make sense. Even the way we store our knowledge, the way and where we store our knowledge is still not recognized as valid because it's in our names, it's in our rivers, it's in our trees, it's in our, it's in the way we dress, it's in the, in the, in the king's, you know, robes. The, the constitution of the Lunda people is in the headdress of the king. You, you get the whole constitution written there. It's stored there. But, you know, things like that are not, are not kind of recognized. And so for us, when you get an object as a physical object or as a digital object, you could be getting a whole volume of history mm. in that object. You could be getting the constitution of a people. You could be getting so much information. And that object, if it's missing from here, mm. means a whole constitution of a certain people has disappeared. Mm -hmm. So in terms of our narrative, for us, objects are also referencing the, you know, the, the way they reference, <laughs> we referenced with objects. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we put that, that, but if we can see the object, even if we don't have it physically, see it digitally, then we can still have that constitution in front of us. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah, that's been the kind of a shocker that has kind of led us to, <laughs> on a few rabbit holes. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult and counterproductive for us to always be challenging, you know, trying to prove ourselves to a system that doesn't recognize our knowledge and perhaps, you know, creating our own knowledge systems and our own platforms saves us the energy that we could be using to say, but it's true, but it's legitimate, but it's, and just say, this is it. this is the knowledge and this is how we are presenting it. Um, now, before I ask my last question, unfortunately, I'll, I have a few questions um, from the crowd, from the audience. Um, and the first one is um, from, uh, just going through them, there are many. You guys are on fire. Uh, Munyarazi, and it says, in your work, have you come across any specific communities, families, or individuals who've been trying to access and repatriate their looted artifacts or um, um, no, yeah. 
Um, in terms of, I think, in terms of like the objects in the Swedish Ethnographic Museum, <laughs> when we kind of announced it even in Zambia, people were like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, they didn't know. we don't even know uh, that, that that has happened. People didn't even know that there were objects from Zambia in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people actually, I think uh, we haven't come across anybody who said, oh, can, you know, there's this object that was taken from us or whatever it is. But it was interesting when we got to the Swedish uh, Ethnographic Museum that there are families that we know whose objects are there, but we've never heard from them. I think if we tell them, oh, your object is, you know, they'll be interested to, to get it back, but um, they, they, they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, no, and we've never really had anybody come to us and say, you know, there's this object mm -hmm. in this museum, you know, but uh, from the, from our interaction with the Swedish, we can now tell some, some, mm. some people and some individuals that, oh, this object actually belongs to your great-great-grandmother and it's in the Swedish Museum. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's sort of that um, chicken and egg situation where either the people could come and say, this is there, but then first you'd have to know that it's there. I think uh, perhaps after you digitize them and make them accessible, you have a lot more people coming coming um, to you and saying, actually, this belongs to so-and-so, always made it by so-and-so. Um, the next question is from uh, Wangari Nyanjui on YouTube. Uh, oftentimes, museums can come up as highbrow or overly academic, true. Have you found real interest for the objects and your work in general from the ground, from the grassroots? Uh, is there, what's the appetite in reception towards um, you are, I think, on the part of the museum in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that, that, as we were saying earlier, that a lot of the times museums tend to be perceived as elitist, even from both sides, you know, there's, there's that discourse and understanding. But I think what was good for the work that we were doing, we were appealing to the people on the ground. You know, we wanted to direct the conversation that way. As much as we wanted to have institutional conversations, we also wanted to focus uh, on the people on the ground to just understand for ourselves, but even to test, as we said, that an experiment for them, whether this would be of interest. Because there's this idea that, oh, museums are boring. Why should we go to the museum? We just see old things there. So for us, it was like, how do we create uh, content that's interesting? for just the general populace, the different demographics, whether it's younger people, whether it's older people. And I think we borrowed a lot from our own cultural narratives and how we tell stories around the fire in the villages. Like, then why wouldn't that apply if it's of interest, you know, to our, in our families, in our communities, surely it would be of interest to bigger populations, to different demographics. So we definitely found in a positive way, they responded in a good way that they wanted more information that they could see themselves. It's the thing of representation. I mean, there's this whole conversation now about representation, especially for people of color in, in mainstream media everywhere. So for us it, at a micro level, it was about representation in narratives anyway because you won't find these narratives anywhere you won't find them in media you won't find them in books so once they started recognizing themselves in these narratives they were much more attracted because then they could understand who they were a lot of the comments that we got from both men and women from the stories of leading ladies was if i knew this as a child or if i knew this as a woman, as a man, I would think of myself as an African in a different way, as a man in a different way, as a woman in a different way. These are all different responses from different episodes people have watched. So that was something, an, an insight that was something we really wanted to pay attention to in terms of does this resonate? Uh, is this something of value to the general populace? And uh, with our digital platform, that's why we're that's why we're, we're literally calling it from village to university, <laughs> because we want we want to engage the whole chain, right down to to the to the grassroots, if you want, in the design of the platform, in the information contribution to the platform, you know, total participation from the ground. 
and as I said, we 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 we're, we're trying this out, but we will also assess the interest of the people on the ground in regard to their own objects and what they want to do about them. So for us, it's kind of let's let's explore this and see how far it takes us. If we can build a model, uh, if we can build something that contributes to a larger conversation, we're happy. But we're certainly we're certainly focused on the ground and. Even with the digital platform, we're going to the ground and then up. Mm. Amazing. Uh, I think even the next question ties into this, and it's from uh, Lisa Graves. Are there any examples of when narrative knowledge from the owners were contradictory? So I guess I don't know if this is contradictory to what's in the museum in Sweden or contradictory to different owners. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was reading, I was reading a history book once. <laughs> Many times. Which, you know, which, which basically wrote off my existence, you know, <laughs> because simply because the, the, the book was about the migration of my ethnic group from Congo to here. And, and the, the, the historian who wrote this said, well, most of this stuff is not even true because these people don't keep, didn't keep their history or whatever the thing is. So it's just a myth, it's a mythology, it's not a real thing. And I'm like, hello, I can show you my great, great grandfather. You know, he, he was part of the migration group that came here and I know him, his wife is true. Like, how can you write us off as a myth? <laughs> but this is a man who's well respected as a his historian, but, you know, and this is what I this is what I say because I see it so often. Even when they just don't understand the word, a word in our language, which can point them to so much history, they miss it and write it off. So yes, I, I for me I was like I can write I can write my family history for you going back three hundred years. So it is not a myth because I know the people who came from Congo. They are my my people. I'm here because of them. So there's a lot. There is a lot of that. I mean, especially stuff that I know <laughs> because mm. I exist because of, the, of, of what it is. And somebody's saying, oh yeah, no, but that's not the way, this mm. is the explanation. I'm like, no. Right now I'm, I'm writing a book discounting the kind of seminal, um, <laughs> everybody quotes Audrey Richards on the, on the puberty rights of the Bemba, my, my group. And I went through that ceremony and She's got it wrong, but she's the she's the you know <laughs> she's the 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 source for anything you want to discuss about the the, the puberty rights and, and it's like no <laughs> so yeah there's a lot of to do and, lot and we do. have to do that. I think uh, it's... sorry Tamba go ahead I was just going to say and it's not even just in books it's even just with cultural practices and mm -hmm. I mean for the longest time there's a in my group, there's a ceremony called the Mukanda. So it's circumcision. It's a rite of passage for boys. And for the longest time, you know, during colonialism, even after that, it was condemned. It was discontinued and discouraged. And, you know, it was looked down upon because, you know, the colonials had said it wasn't a good thing to do. Lo and behold, I don't know, 50 years later, it's, it was now lauded as the best practice for reducing HIV infection. And you know, all the Zambians were like, oh my gosh, this new, uh, this new health uh, practice that will save all the Zambians. And I'm looking at them like, this is your knowledge. Like, why are you praising white scientists for telling you this is a good practice? This is what you've been doing for centuries and centuries that was taken away from you. So there are so many examples that we can give, yeah. Uh, and I think it, it speaks to, uh a Western, but also a very racist way of thinking in which um, African genius, you know, our crafts and our objects are appreciated, but African people are not, you know? So yeah. it's a complete dis disconnect from the people and the objects. And we need to start, we need to continue or even um, go back to seeing ourselves as one, you know, that we created this work, we have done this and we, you know, a sense of ownership around this and I think my last question uh, from the audience is um, by Mwindi, who asked whether there are any contemporary 
objects or pieces that um, will, I think, I guess, would be made available on your platform or within your museum? Are you looking at any contemporary objects that could inspire designers or the techniques, which techniques that could inspire a designer? I can make those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the yeah. clubs, the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, there's, there, there's so many there's so objects many and uh, yeah, and the, yeah, what, what we want, what, what we want to do is, is use history to inform design, because uh, it's one way of bringing back the narrative, but it's also a, a way of, of keeping the narrative uh, alive, but there is a lot of inspiration from the genius from the past that I think uh, contemporary designers and, and and so forth can can use and um, we did the, the we did one experiment where we did a, a, a Tusona Tusona is kind of like the um, the ideograph of of the um, which are a number of ethnic groups that's the way they they preserved their cosmology and their ideas and so forth and so we did some jewelry design from that contemporary and it's you know it's um, <laughs> quite amazing. Um, so we, we, we want to kind of carry that on. But yes, because um, I think one of the things that we do actually, again, an experiment is at the end of the design, we'll actually work with designers and creatives and to kind of like look and engage with the objects and create something that can move from intellectual property of indigenous to market. So we will go through that whole process, you know, from, from the object, you know, developing a uh, contemporary design, whatever it is, it can be digital, it can be uh, creative, you know, it can be a book and then, you know, attempting to experiment on how it will be received on market. Yeah, we, we have, as, as Zambia, we've just passed the, the, the um, Folklore and traditional knowledge uh, IP Act. So we're going to kind of go use that to see how we push that chain uh, to happen. So, yeah, it's um, in the Swedish uh, Ethnographic Museum. The, the 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 most recent objects there are from the 60s. Yeah, from the 60s, and the oldest are from like over 100 years. Okay. Yeah. So there's some even some of the like the dress. The dress that we, you know, <laughs> the dress that we saw uh, is something that young Zam even the young Zambians would say, "Oh yeah, that's you know, that was a like nineteen, you know, sixty-seven kind of dress." So they, they, they are objects right up to the seventies, actually. Yeah, in the museum. I think we have uh, more questions, but uh, somebody Munang, if you could just share your uh, maybe Twitter handle. And um, uh, if we, we don't have time to ask all the questions, they could ask you directly. Um, sure. But yeah, as I, as I finish, as I finish up, um, when we started Open Restitution, we were thinking about how inaccessible information on restitution is, especially to, to us as Africans. And we realized that a lot is happening outside of the public eye. And uh, the word open is a big one for us but it's also a word that we are discovering as we go. And one of the questions that we ask um, all our speakers is um, what, what would an open restitution process look like to you? What openness, what does openness mean to you within this, within this context? Hmm, loading question. <laughs> I think it's a lot of things. I think it's open that we can give the example of the, the conversations that we had with the Swedish Ethnographic Museum, it wasn't one conversation. It was a conversation that happened over three years. So I, I think I, I would go to the Swedish, I would go to Sweden for other projects, right? And then I would always go and visit the Swedish Ethnographic Museum. And our friend, Michael, was the curator there. And he would go through because he was so happy that Africans are here. I can show them some African <laughs> things, you know, and he would go through taking us, this, this is this, this is from Zambia, this is from there. And the more we visited those places, we were like, this doesn't make sense. It can't end at conversations here. How can we extract this conversation and make it a wider conversation that's relevant for, you know, more publics, more people, even other institutions. So that's, 
how the conversation started mm -hmm. from open and, dialogue. Yeah, and I think we're opening it up. I think yeah. I think when we take because what the, the workshop module is is that we will take the objects that are in the ethnographic museum of Sweden and not take them physically, <laughs> digitally, <laughs> and, <laughs> and show them to the to the owners in the villages that were the three villages that we're going to work with and show them that these objects, I, 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 do you recognize them? Are they yours? Oh, they're actually in Sweden. What would you want to happen to them? Because I think for us, that's the most open conversation is to have it with the people who are the owners of the objects to start the conversation with them as well. But we want the conversation to be with the, the owners of and makers of the objects. We want it to be with researchers in Zambia. We want it to be with designers. We want it to be journalists. We've got a whole cohort of groups that we want to open this conversation with in very real um, touchy feely, you know, where they actually see objects and they, and, they, and they can have a discussion about that object mm -hmm. and what that means that it's not here, you know, so that the conversation is, 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 is not just academic, but it actually goes to the heart of, of the people who are actually examining these objects and we're having that conversation with them. So, I think for us, the, the making it open meaning means that we have to, to talk about this with as many groups as possible, but if in as many ways as possible. So if it's a designer, we talk about it as fashion, but the object is not here. What, how do you, you know what I mean? So th that's kind of like, I think the way we are, we're looking at open, um, opening the conversation in, in, in terms of restitution. And I believe, I think what's beautiful and challenging and exciting about it is that we are not just having a one-sided conversation or an expert conversation. You know, we have people who are within the cultural heritage sector, people who are not, people who have never thought they could even consider themselves heritage practitioners. You know, we are expanding the definition of who is allowed to participate in history. And we're seeing that restitution is a very active process, a very personal process. A very emotional mm -hmm. process you know there's so many complexities and speaking with you you with you both and hearing the fascinating work you're doing is really really encouraging i believe um your digital platform and approach to it could set a precedent for so many other museums to consider what it's like to be involved in restitution be involved in repatriation but also incorporate digital technologies within their methodology and um, I'd like to say thank you to you both. You're both excellent speakers. It's been fantastic chatting with you. I wish we had two hours, um, but we're just winding up. It's just slightly past the top of the hour now. Um, and I'd say thank you to you both. Thank you to everyone who's been here. I'll hand over to my colleague, Molemo, who will wrap up the session and tell you more about our next webinar. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samba. Thank you, Mlenga. Uh, amazing conversation. I think we need to apologize to Sophie, Miriam, Mira, Alice Muyambo. We're really sorry we haven't been able to cover all the questions. There's a very dynamic conversation happening in the comments, um, both here and on um, uh, YouTube as well. Um, and it really points to the fact that these discussions are really sort of engaging and people really want to have these conversations. So thank you so much to the two of you for um, really being so generous with your knowledge and um, bringing your experiences to our conversation. And I think, yes, it is a, it's a continuation. This is a kind of introduction to many thoughts, but there's so much more work to do. And we're really grateful that you continue to do the work that you do. And I'm sure we will connect um, further on throughout the rest of the project of the Open Restitution Africa project. Um, as Chow mentioned, we will have um, another webinar next month. Um, we always have the webinars on the last Wednesday of each month. Um, we're hoping to confirm the speaker um, actually in our meeting with him tomorrow. Um, we're very, very excited for the next speaker. I'm really kind of connecting to other parts of the African continent and other kinds of discourses and, and positionalities and bringing um, also museum practitioners who are working in museums and dealing with all the challenges that Samba and Lenga have already raised around museum practice itself. Um, and that will really be the kind of framework of the, uh, the webinar next week. So um, please uh, follow us on all the social medias on our website. Um, you can join our newsletter and we'll keep you updated. Um, I think everybody's wanting to connect with um, Samba and Mulenga via social media. Um, 
There's also the, the, the website of, and Instagram accounts of the actual Women's History Museum of Zambia. Please do follow their work. Um, and I think we, we all want to keep connected and keep this conversation going. So a huge thank you again to both of you and thank you, Chow, um, for, for bringing the conversation on. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Join us next month. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.